Okay, so, and I'm from two Microsoft researches now. Microsoft Research New York City, as well as Microsoft Research New England, which is fine, which is fine. Okay, well, thank you to Andre for, uh, uh, for organizing this lovely workshop. Um, it's been really nice for us to get to know some of the people at Yandex. So what I'm gonna talk about is um, the power of locality for network algorithms. So uh, various projects, a series of three projects on different aspects of, um, of algorithms for large networks. Okay, so online networks are often quite large. Uh, the World Wide Web has trillions of static sites. Uh, Facebook has over, um, over a billion users. So some of the questions we might want to ask, yeah, I'm not planning on using that, so you may want to move it. Uh, some of the questions that we'd like to look at are how do we rank various sites relative to each other? Um, uh, yeah. Things like page rank. Um, how do we find the most, um, the most influential site or a set of the most influential sites um, under some definition, like the most highly connected or the most, uh, the most influential under um, a certain model, like the Cascade model for, uh, uh, for, um, for viral marketing. How do we do things like cover the graph? So is, is there a problem with this or not? Is it okay? Okay. Um, so for example, um, on LinkedIn, if you're uh, um, a recruiter who's trying to reach people on LinkedIn, um, how do you set up your network in such a way that you can cover the graph and find the people you're trying to reach. Okay, so the constraints that we have here are first constraints on what parts of the network are, uh, uh, are visible to us. So for example, on Facebook and LinkedIn, and this actually changes over time, at the time at which we were doing this project, and I think actually it changed in reaction to some of the results we got on the project. But at the time at which we were doing it in Facebook, you could see friends of your friends, but you couldn't see how many friends they had. On LinkedIn, you could see friends of your friends, and you could also see how many people they, uh, 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 they were connected to. Okay, doesn't sound like a vastly different amount of information, but it has huge consequences. There are also um, very serious um, uh, uh, limitations um, on the compute time. Okay, these are really massive networks. If we want to compute something online, um, the, the, um, the compute time is, is very important. So for the first case, we need local algorithms because we can only do things locally. And in the second case, we want the algorithms to be uh, very efficient, even if it means that we don't get quite as good an answer. Okay, we're m usually more concerned about finding an answer quickly than about finding the, um, the best answer we possibly could in a long period of time. Okay, so I'm going to talk about several pieces of work. The first is network, uh, uh, network algorithms with local access constraints. So I'll present context where I'll define what I mean by a local information algorithm. Uh, paid, so uh, I'll, 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 give you, um, I'll give you some examples of that. And then we'll look at um, local information um, algorithms on preferential attachment networks and also on general networks. Is it not working? It's working, oh, okay. Um, and that was something that a uh, number of us did in WINE a few years ago. 
Okay, then um, the second thing I'll talk about is using locality to get sublinear algorithms without a priori access constraints. But how do we use locality? Okay, even though we don't have a constraint like in Facebook or LinkedIn, how do we build, uh, uh, build a local um, algorithm um, to get something that we could do in sublinear time, so less than the number of nodes of the graph. I'll look at the page rank problem, okay? And this was something uh, that we did a couple of years ago also. And more recently, um, a sublinear algorithm for finding, um, uh, finding the sites that you might want to use for viral marketing, for example. How do I find a set of case sites such that if I want to start something from those sites, those are going to be uh, very, um, um, very influential sites. Okay. So let's start out with the local access constraint problem. So somebody moves to a new city and they want to meet the most influential people in the city as a proxy. So there's a network problem here. Um, as a proxy, you might say you want to find the most connected person, okay? So, the problem is when you go in, you, of course, don't see the graph. So, it's a local access problem. You start from some place, you see the neighbor, and you see that the neighbor has two connections. So, you pick one of them. Oops. What did I just do? Did I do something? Okay. Um, so I, so I, so I pick. Wait. So the first thing I do is I just pick that person because that's the only one that I see. Then I expose the neighbors of those people. Okay, I clearly would rather go to this guy than to that guy because he has more connections. So I go there, and then I look and I say, okay, well, I would rather go here because he has more connections, and I found the most highly connected person. Okay? So the motivating question is, how well can a, can a graph algorithm do when we have only local, um, uh, local visibility of the network structure. Later, I'm also going to add a uniformly random hop to this, you know, which is the kind of thing we sometimes see, like in page rank. So there are cases in which you can access uniformly at random some site from the graph in addition to local access. Okay, and how do we do this on natural networks as a function of the level um, the level of visibility from your current location. Okay, um, so social uh, network uh, applications. Well, so Facebook, as I said, at least as of that time, you could see friends of friends, but you couldn't see how many friends they had. LinkedIn, you could see friends of friends and how many friends they had. Uh, uh, Orkut and uh, uh, Google Plus, you could see friends of friends of friends and how many friends they had. Okay, so what is the impact of the design choice? You might think it's just a little bit, you know, how could, you know, this or this or this really make a difference? Maybe I only need, you know, two, three, whatever, um, you know, log in times as many steps or something. Okay, so more generally, there are lots of kinds of problems we might want to do. We might want to do a search problem. So find the highest degree node, find the most central node by some definition of centrality, like the, Mon uh, uh, the Bonnachet's uh, centrality or some other definition of centrality. Coverage problem. We might want to find the, uh, uh, the, minimum, um, the minimum dominating set. If I'm in an HR department and I'm trying to recruit people and I'm on LinkedIn, you know, what are the connections that I have to have such that I can then see the whole network? That's the minimum dominating set problem. 
uh, the maximum K coverage problem, for example, or a connectivity problem, shortest path from one site to another site, or a different kind of connectivity problem, a multicast problem. How do I, from a given site, do a multicast very efficiently? Okay, so by local, I mean here that the graph topology is, uh, uh, is revealed locally as the algorithm builds its output set. Okay, so I'm going to give a model of this, and then I'm going to talk about uh, 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 preferential attachment graphs, and then I'll talk about the, uh, uh, the minimum, minimum dominating set problem on a general network. Okay, so I start out with a graph. Um, I don't know the graph, and my output is going to be a subset of the vertices of the graph. So I want to find feasible, so I'm, I'm trying to satisfy something, and so I'll have a set which satisfies that. And what I want to do is I want to find the smallest one. So uh, there are two operations. I can add a uniformly random node, so we can think of this, as I said, you know, in PageRank we, we do this. We add a uniformly random node. Um, or we can add any uh, 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 visible node, visible by the definition of what is local for the, the model. Okay, so you, you could say that all nodes a distance R from the set plus the induced subgraph. I must be hitting something here. Um, there, okay. Um, so plus... Okay, the, um, plus the number of neighbors of the outermost node. So if I see things a distance one from my set, plus the induced subgraph on that, plus the degrees of the outermost nodes, then I call that a one local algorithm. If I see things distance two, plus the induced subgraph, plus the degrees of the outermost nodes, I would call that a two-local algorithm, okay? So um, what I want to do when I map it to Facebook and LinkedIn questions is I want to think of this as the distance out from my current set of friends, okay? So I've got me and my current friends on Facebook. If I can see a distance one out from them, plus the degrees of those nodes, then I would say that's a one local algorithm, okay? Now, on Facebook, I can only see the friends, but I can't see their degrees, so I can't do one local. On LinkedIn, I can see the friends of friends and how many friends they have, so on LinkedIn, I can do a one local algorithm, and on Facebook, at least at various times, I could not do a one local algorithm because I could see the friends of my friends, but I could not see how many neighbors they had, okay? So, one local algorithm, so I see here, so th this was my set, time one, and my friends, and how many neighbors they had, and I just go out from there, and I can also do a hop to some, yeah. Oh, I see the induced sub. Oh, you're you're saying, so I'm I'm calling a one local algorithm something where I can see the induced so edge. Right, right, and there could be distinctions. And LinkedIn was letting you see the induced subgraph, actually, and Facebook was not for a while. So I could see. I could look at somebody and say, oh, are these two acquaintances of mine acquaintances of each other? Okay. You see the degree of your neighbors, but not, and you, but not their actual... But not their actual neighbors. Yeah. Not their actual neighbors. So what I mean by one local is that I see the induced subgraph and the outside degree. I mean, this is just my definition of what it means to be one local or two local. Okay. 
the open one ball, but then you would ask, what does open one ball mean? And what it means is that I see the induced subgraph and the number of neighbors. Okay. Two local, much bigger. Okay. Uh, on, in this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on one local. Okay. Um, preferential attachment networks. I think everybody here knows this. I begin with a small fixed graph. You know, uh, every time, let's say, you know, a fixed number like two more edges are sent out proportional to the degree of the, exist the, the existing degree of, of the nodes. And, you know, they're connected with high probability. I'm not sure why I put with high probability that regular preferential attachment is connected. It has a, a small diameter, so log n over log log n. Uh, Bolabash and Reardon proved that, I think, in 2000. Uh, power law degree sequence. Okay, one over, you know, the, the probability that I have k neighbors goes like one over k cubed. And older nodes tend to have, um, tend to have higher degrees. Okay, and what I really care about here is the small diameter. Okay, so let's say that what I want to do is find the root of my preferential attachment network. Turns out it's, it's very useful. If I can find the root, then I can do other interesting things, like I can connect S to T nicely because I can connect S to the root and connect T to the root. So if I can find the root, I can do other nice, nice things as well. Um, an opportunistic um, algorithm is just say that my set is an arbitrary node. If it doesn't contain the root, then um, I add the node in the neighborhood with the largest degree. Okay, so it's just greedy. Okay, and this is one local because I look at my neighborhood. Okay, and it's possible to remove, um, um, to remove the assumption that the algorithm knows if it's the root or not. Okay, but I'm not going to go into that. Okay, well, it turns out that with a one local algorithm, you can find the root really quite quickly log into the fourth queries with high probability over the random graph, over the, the, uh, the preferential attachment process. Okay, so it's really, really quite fast. Um, I would have to go through the proof and see. I would imagine that it actually would go through with some integrability condition on the power, but I'm not sure. Okay. Preferential. He's talking about preferential attachment. Yeah. Prefer here I'm using the standard definition, the Barbashi-Albert definition of preferential attachment, which is proportional attachment, right? So the question was, how sensitive is this to the 1 over k cubed? And the 1 over k cubed is preferential. But, you know, if I were doing a Malloy read, a, a configuration type model, um, which had, you know, 1 over k to the fourth, I would imagine it would be similar, but I'm not sure if I tried to do something like that. Okay. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd have to go through the, the, the proof, but one, one could. Now, note that a random walk, if I wanted to just find the root by doing a random walk, it would take square root of n. So this is dramatically different. Okay. Really dramatically different. Okay, so on LinkedIn, if I'm trying to find the root of my network, since LinkedIn gives you one local information, if I were opportunistic, you know, if I just did a greedy algorithm, given the information that LinkedIn gives me, I could actually find the root pretty quickly. Um, on Facebook, it would take me a really long time to find the root. And it's interesting, because after we came out with this, Result, then Facebook changed its rules a little bit <laughs> and showed you a little more. Because I, I, I think that at first you don't imagine that a 
slight difference, like I can see the number of neighbors, I can't see the number of neighbors, is going to create this huge difference in the amount of time it takes to find the root. Okay, and then applications. As I said, you know, why would I care about finding the root? Well, for example, ST connectivity, you know, if I want to connect two sites to each other, I can connect them both to the root. So, you know, it's again order log to the fourth n. You know, k terminals, obviously, it's k times uh, log, log to the fourth. If I want to find the k um, nodes of largest degree, I just get an additive factor of k. I just don't stop. And there are other things that I might try to do. Okay, but you wouldn't imagine, I mean, we were really surprised by this, you know, that, oh my, a little difference like this makes a huge difference in what a, how fast a greedy algorithm can do something like find the, the starting node. Okay, so, yeah? Yeah, so I'm assuming that the graph is, is connected. So I'm assuming that it was formed as a connected graph, yes. Otherwise, I would just do this component by component. I mean, obviously, yeah, I'm not going to find it if it's not connected. But I can find the root of that piece, of, of that component. Right, I can find the root of a given component this way. Yeah. But this is preferential attachment. I mean, he's now thinking Facebook, LinkedIn, which haven't really formed by preferential attachment anyway. But if they had, then... Right, but he's, I think he's thinking of the real world, unlike people like me who just say preferential attachment. Isn't that Facebook? Which it's not, but okay. So let me just tell you what's going on in the proof. This is even, it's not even quite a sketch, but it's kind of what's, what's going on here. So the, the hope, if I were to try to prove this, what I would hope in doing my proof is that I could argue that I'm going to reach a node that, that, that after k poly log n steps, I can reach a node of degree 2 to the k. I can keep going out, you know, and getting, you know, larger and larger nodes. The problem is that reaching a node of high degree does not necessarily imply progress. So here's a picture. You know, I start going, and if I were just following, if I were just being greedy, then I would go here because this has two neighbors and each of these only have one neighbor, but really I'm trying to get there, right? So that's why this really naive proof would not work. However, um, if there's a path that connects the set I start with to the root and all nodes have degree at least D, then on, on the path, then I'm never going to query a node of degree less than D because why would I do that? <laughs> okay, because I'm, I'm greedy. So the question is how common are these good paths? And it turns out in the preferential attachment model, okay, and this is where I would have to go and check whether it would be true if I had some other graph notion that was a heavy tail distribution with a different fall off than preferential attachment, um, that most nodes lie on good paths with constant probability. Okay, so a detailed probabilistic analysis. And in the process of doing this, I think we proved some conjectures that were left open uh, uh, by uh, Bela, um, Bela and Oliver on the preferential attachment process. So it wasn't easy, easy, but it was, you know, okay. We sort of understand what happens in the preferential attachment model. In the preferential attachment model, what often happens is that a vertex of very high degree is connected to a vertex of lower degree and then connected again to a vertex mm -hmm. of higher degree. So seeing your one neighborhood plus the extra degrees gives you much gives more information than right not you're you're degrees. you're blindly going down this path so right. that little bit of information turns out to be enough to well, to keep you on a good path and that is very special for preferential attachment models that is because in configuration models in configuration models it's going to be much more random 
That's yeah. true. And vertices of high degree yeah. are more directly connected yeah. to vertices. Of yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be more uniform. Yeah. yeah. What was your deck D was just an input parameter? Or was C is an input parameter? Yeah, so I can do this for some. D, yeah. yeah, just for some, but the, but the point is, so when I go through the proof, then I'm going to have to choose the D carefully to make everything work out, <laughs> okay, um, you know, which is doing the proof backwards, but that's how we do proofs, right? Okay, so general graph. So let me now not look at the preferential attachment model anymore, but let me still think about this idea of a one local or an R local algorithm. Okay, it's still a meaningful notion to discuss on a general graph. And the thing I want to think about here, because I'm thinking about LinkedIn and I'm thinking about a recruiter on LinkedIn, you know, and they want to cover the graph, right? Um, so what I want to do is I want to find the smallest set such that, and, and in this case it happens to be Two, okay, there are two nodes that I can find here such that everybody's neighbor of one of these two nodes. So this is a minimum dominating set of this graph, okay? But in general, I want to find a minimum dominating set. It turns out that um, with set cover, one can pretty easily get a lower bound of the maximum degree, so I'm not going to be able to do it faster than the max then something of order the max uh, uh, the max degree and I don't remember who GK was um, anyway but G and K in 98 um, they weren't thinking about local algorithms um, but uh, it turns out that they had a three local algorithm that gave them a similar upper bound the log of the max degree so the question is, how well can a one local algorithm perform here? Okay, so let's think about a greedy algorithm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize S to a random node, and if I haven't yet covered the graph, if I haven't yet found a dominating set such that everybody's a neighbor of somebody in, in the set S, then I'm going to add the node which maximizes the size of the set that's covered, you know, with all the neighbors of, of the set. Okay. So, um, so here we go. This guy is the guy that I would add at this point, right? Because I say, oh, I'm going to cover more if I go there because he has three neighbors. This guy only has one neighbor and this guy has two neighbors, okay? So, so if I were greedy, I would add this node. Okay, so let's see how a local greedy algorithm works on this example. Okay, um, well, Optimally, you know, I could find this in order one time, but let's say I, were un I was unlucky, so let's say this is the first node I pick. Well, then clearly I'm going to pick this node because this guy has lots and lots of neighbors, so I go there. But then I'm kind of screwed because everybody has two neighbors, and if I'm just unlucky, you know, it takes me a really long time to get there, okay? So it takes me a board around. So just greedy is not good. And, and we know this, right? You know, you kind of, you, you get stuck, you get unlucky, whatever. So that's not good. So how about a greedy random algorithm? So uh, sometimes I do a greedy step and sometimes I just add a random node, okay? So let me, let me try that, because the other one surely isn't going to do it for me because I've got a counterexample. Okay, well, it turns out greedy random is really good. It obtains um, something of order, you know, one plus uh, constant times log delta approximation in expectation and with high probability. Okay, so um, one local is enough for a greedy random algorithm, greedy on the one local part, you know, so I see one local and I'm greedy on that and I do a random step every now and then. Okay, so uh, what's going on here is that if I have something in the dominating set, okay, <clears throat> what I don't want to do is I don't want to waste T 
too much time covering the neighbor of this guy. I, I want to pick this guy pretty soon. I don't want to cover most of his neighborhood before I pick him, okay? Because then it'll take me too long. I That's what was question. going on in that counterexample, right? In that counterexample, I, the, 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 the guy on the right was... Um, a good node to pick, but then even after I picked him, I covered all those other nodes in, in his neighborhood. Okay, I'd, I don't want to do that kind of thing. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider some X, which I assume is chosen greedily by the algorithm, and which covers some neighbor of some guy who's going to turn out to be in the optimum. This guy, I mean, I'm assuming there's more to this graph, but this guy has tons and tons of neighbors. He's going to be in the optimum. I don't know that yet. I've picked some X, which, is, which has a neighbor in common with this guy that I want to be in the optimum. And I don't want to spend too much time getting from this guy to the neighbor. OK? So there are a couple of possibilities. So let's say that V was visible. So here, this guy's already in the set. And the red ones are the ones that I've seen, but I haven't chosen for the set yet. So this guy is in the set, so I actually see V. For other reasons, let's say I see all of these guys. So they've got connections out here, the guys which are in the set. Okay? Well, um, this, this doesn't look too good, okay? <laughs> On the other hand, if I chose X greedily, what this means is that x, well, I'm not sure if this is true. Yes, OK. x has four unexposed neighbors. <laughs> and v actually has four unexposed neighbors at this point. In general, if I chose x greedily, <clears throat> then x probably itself <clears throat> covers many nodes. If x itself covers many nodes, I'm in fine shape. It's good that I chose it, OK? Let's say V was not visible. So here, these guys have been exposed from other things. V itself is not visible, OK? There are a couple of possibilities again. Either X itself has tons and tons of neighbors, in which case, well, it doesn't matter that it's good that I picked. X, or X itself doesn't have a lot of neighbors. Well, if X itself doesn't have a lot of neighbors, then I have a pretty good chance of picking the one that's going to expose V in the next step. Okay, so that's kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm going into the guts of the proof and like telling you why I'm either going to be exposing some guy, choosing some guy I really want to choose anyway, or I'm not going to be wasting too much time covering the neighborhood of something in the optimal. Okay, so that's what's going on there. So conclusions from part one. So this is local access algorithms. So what I did was I gave you a definition of a local access algorithm. Okay, so this is a sequential decision with limited network visibility maybe adding some uniformly random steps to it. Many problems can be solved locally and efficiently in preferential attachment graphs and in general graphs. And as we saw in that example of finding the root, which can be used for other things, there's a huge difference in what seems to be a minor difference in design choice of whether an algorithm is one local or, or not make, can, can make a really big difference in, in the amount of time. OK, so that's kind of you're presented with something which only has limited visibility. Now something that a priori sounds different, but turns out, again, you go to local algorithms. Let's say you've just got some huge graph like the web. You're not a priori given <clears throat> a local sequential algorithm, okay? But you were told you want <clears throat> to do something interesting, and you want to do it very, very quickly, okay? So 
it turns out in that case, you often do want to do a local sequential algorithm plus some random steps. And of course, you know, <coughs> uh, the canonical example of that, you know, for all of you guys at Yandex, obviously, is PageRank, okay? You have some random steps, you have some local moves, <coughs> that's the random walk <coughs> of page rank. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two, um, two algorithms. One is a sublinear algorithm for finding page rank. It's a very, very fast algorithm for finding page rank. And the other is a sublinear, um, sublinear algorithm for uh, 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 influence maximization in the cascade model. Okay, by the way, I'm going to finish well before the hour and a half so that you'll get a little break, okay, because I don't want you to have three hours of us without a break. I, even I would find that too much. David? <laughs> you should, yeah, because I think they're, they're taping it. Yeah? <laughs> I'll try to help you finish on time rather than before by asking questions. But uh, on, the log, on the greedy random algorithm, so, uh, the approximation guarantee is log. Uh, uh, the approximation guarantee is, del, uh, is log, uh, log of, of the, the degree. maximum degree. So if you have a preferential attachment model, that would be log of n, essentially. But if you actually run it on preferential attachment, do you expect a better performance you than this kind of worst case? Because log n approximation factor is a bit too large. Yes, yes. So it, it, it actually does better, yes, than, than that in, in practice. Um, I don't know if that's provable. Is it, do you recall? Were we able to prove anything on that? I don't think so. No, no, approximate, I, I, I thought a log, a log it, delta was approximation In the approximation guarantee. factor, factor, right? Because it was one plus two log delta approximation factor. <sighs> Let me think about that. And do you recall whether we could do The random greedy. Uh, in the random, the random greedy algorithm. He wasn't paying any attention. <laughs> he was reading his email on his phone. In the random, you were, uh, in the random <clears throat> greedy, well, then you were surfing the web. <laughs> you were looking at your phone. In the random greedy, I see. In the random greedy algorithm for um, finding the root, okay. Um, no, finding the minimum dominating set. Not minimum finding dominating, the, the last finding, problem. You, you right, finding the minimum dominating set. Okay, the approximation factor was one plus two log delta, where delta is the maximum degree. No, we can't prove that it's better. I mean, I think we tried it and it was better, but I don't think it's provably better. And I wonder if we couldn't even construct, I don't know, the counterexample. <sighs> okay, so, I mean, I was going to say, can I construct a counterexample? But of course, with a random step, would be hard to construct a counterexample. So I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure of that. Do you? No. Em em empirically, but David is asking, provably, um, and that's a good so challenge. So okay. in the <laughs> Erdos-Renyi graph, you can just uh, find uh, by factor two, I think, by just a straightforward greedy algorithm. You mean in the, the minimum dominating set? Well, maximum but independent set, which yeah, is sort because, of which because, is because 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 a dominating set doesn't very make any. Very related, uh, but yeah. that's an Erdos-Renyi graph, so yeah. a professional attachment model. But you might get a better performance. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not sure of the answer to that. Actually, I'm not sure of the answer to that. So you're right. I mean, it's obviously only meaningful for a bounded degree. Um, okay. So, which LinkedIn presumably is, is not. Although, well, I guess it officially is because you're not allowed to have more than a certain number, but yeah. Um, so, it officially is, but you might not want to be the log of that big number. Um, 
Okay, so, so uh, we're going to do page rank first. So, I mean, I'm sure, as almost all of you know, or all of you know, uh, you treat the World Wide Web as a directed graph, and you walk over the hyperlinks, and you do a random walk, and every one of Ralph's time, you jump someplace so that you don't get stuck in a dead end. Okay, and the stationary distribution is page rank. So what does that mean? Okay, well, so what is the random walk matrix? So I take the adjacency matrix, I divide by the out degree, right, and this is M MUV, um, and I get the stationary distribution of that pi. I could do a random walk with a restart at the site U, so how would I, with probability alpha, so how do I do that? Alpha, with alpha probability, I start at U, one minus alpha, I just do my walk, uh, according to the random walk matrix. Page rank is simply defined to be this, okay, that I start, I restart at some random, some random site um, with probability alpha. Otherwise, I take a, I, I, I do a random walk step. Personalized page rank is always restarting at the point U, okay, so I get a personalized page rank um, vector from restarting at the point U. The, um, the other way of looking at it is um, <clears throat> let me look at all the things which contribute to the page rank at the site V. I don't know if you've ever tried, um, you know, if, if you've ever done this for yourself on the web, there are demos of this. So you can look at who contributes to your page rank. It's kind of cool to look at this vector of, you know, especially if it's expressed graphically, where you see kind of thickness of lines for the size of the entry there. Where are you getting your page rank from? Okay, that's what a contribution vector is telling you, how much of your page rank is coming from different sites. And then finally, the page rank of, of the site V is just the sum over the contributions coming into V from every place. So you sum up all the contributions to you, and that's your page rank, properly normalized. Okay? Okay, so... The significant page rank problem, so I've got, so, you know, I've got a graph, it has n vertices, it has m edges. The significant page rank problem is to find all pages with page rank greater than some delta here. Delta is no longer maximum degree. I know I'm using the same, the same notation. Okay, but find all, um, all pages with, you know, page rank greater than 1 one hundredth, um, and don't give me anything that has page rank less than, you know, uh, d d what is it, so half a percent, okay? So, you know, I don't have to get it precisely with no smaller ones, but I have to get all the, all the bigger ones and nothing that's a lot smaller. <clears throat> okay, and previous results based um, at, uh, for, for the running time, there's a method called the power iteration method that was able to do it of order the number of edges in the system. There was a linear algebra Im improvement of this, which took it down a lot to the number of nodes. Um, there was a lower bound on the running time uh, which, uh, the, the way to think about getting this lower bound, I mean, this is easy. Um, so, you, you remember, what I'm trying to do is, you know, delta is like 1 100th, let's say. Okay. Uh, oh, it's n over 100. Yes, yeah, so I normalized page rank to be n here, not 1. Okay. So, sorry about that. Um, so... Yeah, delta, I'm sorry, delta is like with my normalization, 
I'm looking at uh, n over 100 here, okay? If I normalize page rank to be n, okay, instead of to be 1, um, then this is everything bigger than n over 100 and um, nothing smaller than um, uh, n over 200, okay? So now what I want to do is from n over <coughs> Delta sites with um, it, what I'm what I'm getting this lower bound from is having n over delta sites with a page rank of delta, roughly speaking, and all the rest of the sites have page rank zero. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to do better than n over delta here. Okay, but can we use locality? Can we find a local algorithm to get an additive epsilon approximation which essentially matches the lower bound, okay? So can we do this well? Can we solve the significant page rank problem in time of order n over delta with some locks, okay? So a roadmap for how I would do this, okay? So. If I, if I want to think about it in steps, what I might want to do is calculate each entry P U goes to V. So this is all the contribution to um, website V from website U, okay? So all the contribution to my website from Christian's website, okay, but not just me and Christian, everybody, <laughs> okay. Then each page rank is the sum of the n terms, okay? So, uh, you know, my page rank, if this is the whole universe, my page rank is all of your contributions to my page rank. And then I want to do this for all contribution vectors. Okay, and a priori, each step should take of order n time. Okay. So, how do I calculate this guy, the contribution of U to V, okay? Um, there was um, a good amount of previous work on this. Uh, Je, um, Je and Whittem, uh, 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 Jennifer Whittem there, um, had something which is of order log n. I'm trying to get an epsilon approximation, additive epsilon approximation, 1 over epsilon times the maximum in degree. Um, uh, Reed Anderson and Fan Chung and, and, and I think uh, Lincoln Liu um, were able to get rid of the log n. Of course, as David was saying before, this might not be very good. <laughs> if the in degree is unbounded, you don't want this. Okay. Um, so then there was a random um, result. Uh, so there was a Monte Carlo based approach which removed the dependence on the maximum in degree. It gave a multiplicative bound. You'll see some rows floating around later. Those are the multiplicative um, errors. Um, but the, the approximation um, had a factor which uh, uh, which depended on which U and V you were looking at. And we modified this and handled the concentration better to remove that. Okay, so how did we do that? Well, we looked at something called terminating random walk. So a terminating random walk, instead of doing a hop every seventh step, I'm going to just terminate every seventh step, okay? And otherwise, I'm going to, you know, do a random walk step. Okay, note that if I were to start a terminating random walk at the site U, then the probability that it happens to terminate at V is PUV, okay? Because that's just the definition of what PUV is. Okay, so that's the useful thing to remember about a terminating random walk. Okay, so now I have these factors in here. This guy is actually a multiplicative factor which comes from the Forgas et al. 
Um, and this is the additive factor. But basically, what I want to do, okay, is for a reasonable number of steps, which I calculate to make everything come out the way it's supposed to come out, I'm going to run a terminating random walk up to a certain length. So I'm going to cap it at a certain length. If it hasn't terminated, okay, keeps flipping this, you know, one-seventh coin, but if it has a nice string and it hasn't terminated, I'm just going to cap it at this length, okay. Um, if it terminates before reaching, the, and remember, I'm trying to get an additive epsilon approximation and this is the weighting of my coin. Okay, and if it hasn't terminated before reaching the capping length, well, think about this statement. What's happening? Well, the, the place where it last visits before terminating, okay, I would be contributing to that PUV, so I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to add one to the counter of the site V. So V is getting a lot of page rank con contributed to it if, it if it terminates before reaching the, the capping length. And I'm going to output the average count that's, that's accumulated at each node, and I actually get something which, which looks good. Okay. So, that's, so, so, so for calculating P PUVs, it turns out I can, do, I can do pretty well now. I haven't lost too much. Okay. However, remember, I still have two more steps that I have to do. Okay. I still, so I've got some P PUV. Now I'm supposed to add it up. Okay. So, so now I've got what, P what PUV is, but I'm supposed to add up N of these. Okay. I'm supposed to add up for all the U's, the contribution to my page rank. Okay. And geez, I don't want to do n of these because then I've blown my, my estimate. So what do I do in, instead? And by the way, I don't actually calculate all the PVs. I only calculate them as I need them. Okay. I go back and do this as I need it. Okay. But I, I can't just sum it because it takes time in. So, okay, let me do naive sampling. Let me pick, um, what, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find out if my page rank is bigger than delta. Okay, so what I'd like to do is see, is my page rank bigger than delta, but I don't want to add up n terms. So I'm going to pick out some number L of, of these. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick out, you know, five of the people in the audience, five of the 50 people in, in the audience. And I'm, I'm trying to see if my page rank is bigger than delta, but instead what I'm going to do is see if the contribution of five of you to me is five out of the 50 of you is bigger than one-tenth delta, okay? Well, it turns out that doesn't work because if I do turn off to get the concentration that I need, um, then, then I land up with one error, and if I make sure that the error doesn't drown out the expectation, I've got this other error, and I get the square of what I need if I want to make sure that my expectation doesn't get drowned out and that it's sufficiently concentrated, it doesn't work. Okay, I get the square of, of what I need. Okay. On the other hand, if instead of just picking out five out of the 50 of you, <laughs> started having, I mean, I don't have enough of you to do this. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I would choose many scales and I would see how many entries of the contribution vector lie in these little intervals at different scales. So if thousands and thousands of people were listening to this, I could do stuff at different scales, okay? I could, you know, do, do something at one scale, then in another scale, then in another scale. And what lands up happening is that I land up spending most of my time because I'm going to look at how much of the contribution vector lies in a particular interval, I'm going to spend most of my time in the places where I'm getting most of the contribution to my page rank. Okay, and if I do that, lots of work, then I get the right estimate. Okay, and I get the estimate that I want. And finally, how do I get to this question 
for me to this question for everybody. So let's say I found out that my page rank is bigger than delta, or I found out that my page rank is less than delta over two, okay? Now, I'm supposed to do that for all of you, okay? Well, I'm gonna use sparse matrix methods. I'm gonna do this for all of us in parallel, okay? So I'm gonna do all, all columns in, in parallel, and sparse matrix methods are great. It allowed me to maintain, I mean, I'm not showing you how, but I use, so I do us all in, in parallel. So I do the page rank for all of us in parallel. So now, the, the first step, I was clever with my, with my terminating random walks to calculate the PUVs. The second step, I was clever in doing my sampling <clears throat> to get my page rank, sampling from contributions from you guys. And the last step, I was clever by doing things in parallel with sparse matrix methods. And so I'm able to, to get all of this. Now, what if, you know, you may still say to me, oh, but you're still of order n. Yeah, I'm still of order n, but if I am willing to ask, instead of for delta to be a constant, if I'm willing to ask for delta to be n to the p, for p less than one, so if I'm asking, you know, because I don't really expect anybody to have a, you know, positive fraction of the, of the page rank, you know, okay. So if I, if I do this, then, then I can get sublinear time. The large page ranks, the really large page ranks, okay? Right. So you're, yeah, Nellie? Right. So uh, these are the only ones that I want anyway. And now it runs in sublinear time. Okay. Okay. So final topic, sublinear algorithms for models of influence maximization. This is pretty short because I'm going to make it quite sketchy because it actually gets complicated. <laughs> Okay, so I've got the independent cascade model, which was introduced by Kempe, Kleinberg, and Tardosh in 2003 as a model, um, as a model of uh, uh, viral, um, viral marketing. So what they have is they have an oriented graph, and, and along the M edges, along each of the M edges, they have the probability that an infection will spread out along that edge. So, uh, Let's say I have a huge influence on Christian. Doesn't mean Christian will have a large influence on me, okay? Doesn't mean I'll have a large influence on Remco, okay? So it's an oriented graph and there are different probabilities, okay? And, um, and so if I start with the seed set S, okay, so if I start off with, you know, three of us, how big a set am I gonna reach in expectation? Okay, and for fixed seed size, what I want to do is I want to find, so, you know, I want to find the three of us who will be most influential in expectation. And I want to give, you know, each of us Windows phones, <laughs> okay, <laughs> because I'm trying to spread Windows phones. Okay, so previous results. Uh, so this is a submodular function which means it can be approximated to within 1 minus 1 over e via greedy algorithm. I mean, that's a, a general result. Um, so with Oracle access to this, so Oracle access requires, um, if k were equal to 1, if I wanted to find the most influential person, I would just check the influence of everybody, okay? So that would be of order n, that's my, my Oracle. If I want the k most influential of us, then I need 
I got the first most influential, and then I have to run the whole thing again on the remaining n minus one of us, and so on. So it's k times n. So Oracle access is pretty expensive. Um, uh, and so if I, if I do all that, it turns out that the total runtime is at least, um, at least quadratic in, in n, even if it's a sparse graph, even if m is of order n. Okay, so it takes a really long time. And this was, I think, what was in the KKT paper. It was, you know, they, they, they just gave this very crude estimate. Okay, and then other people have done other things since then, and I think we have the, um, the um, best results now. We have a nearly linear time algorithm, which um, if we scale something in a certain way, we can make sublinear. So we can find an approximately optimal seed with an approximation factor of instead of 1 minus 1 over e, 1 minus 1 over e minus epsilon, in a time that grows like m plus n, number of edges plus number of sites over epsilon cubed, there's a lower bound of m plus n. So this is essentially optimal. Um, okay, and then we also have a sublinear time um, algorithm. We can find something to wi within, an, um, within an approximation factor of 1 over beta. We can choose beta later to be a power of n. Um, in a time which scales like n over beta, my approximation factor, times, uh, uh, times the arboricity of the graph. The, the arboricity is the minimum number spanning first necessary to cover all the, um, all the edges of G, but roughly speaking, it correlates with the density of the graph. A very dense graph has a large arboricity. A, you know, a, a not very dense graph has a smaller, um, a smaller uh, uh, arboricity. Okay, so key elements of the proof. This is going to be very, very sketchy, but what we do is that we pre-process G with a, um, a random, random sampling. So again, we have sampling in here, um, and we get a sparse hypergraph, um, hypergraph representation of the graph, which retains the um, characteristics of the, uh, uh, the high um, the high influence nodes. So basically what happens is that each edge in this hypergraph is going to be coming from a random node in the transpose of the graph. And why are transposes coming in? They come in for the same reason that backwards random walks come in in a lot of these local, um, these local uh, uh, algorithms like the um, the Anderson et al. Uh, what's, what's going on is that um, you're walking in from the outside, which is keeping, um, keeping, keeping the algorithm local. You're, rather than spreading out, you're actually looking, um, looking at the effect as you're running things backwards, which keeps it much more local. Um, the, sorry. Um, uh, the influence of S in the graph has to do with the degree of the set S in the hypergraph. So this is very sketchy. I mean, I'm not really telling you why this is working, but it's local and it's applicable in many access models. Um, and for the sublinear variant that we do with the 1 over beta approximation, where I can choose beta to be a power of n, I, instead of just doing the greedy thing which constructed this hypergraph before, I add some random steps to it, okay? So that was probably a completely non-understandable sketch of a pretty complicated proof. But one of the reasons that I put that non-understandable sketch in is because you saw some other things in, in, um, in the the other two parts of the talk. Um, and this was similar to and inspired by those. Basically, um, what's going on in a lot of these proofs is that we're doing several things. We're doing sampling, sometimes at multiple scales, rather than probing all of, um, all of the elements. I mean, how do we get the time down in these, um, 
in these online algorithms for these massive graphs. One thing that we have to do, obviously, is sample. Sometimes you can sample at one scale. Sometimes you have to go to multiple scales. Um, you intersperse greedy steps with random steps. It's very, very important that PageRank has this random step, as we know, otherwise we get stuck. There are other reasons why you may not be getting stuck, but like in the, uh, the, um, the dominating set problem, you can just have a really you know, bad uh, series of, of um, very bad series of choices, and a random step will get you out of that. And then you maintain locality by doing either backwards random walks, or you have transposes of matrices, which are telling you that you, you look at um, who is getting influenced by, which tends to move things in locally, um, to find the large, um, uh, the large contributors. Okay, so we can get sublinear, um, sublinear algorithms with reasonable approximation ratios for many kinds of questions, for finding the most highly connected node or nodes, for um, trying to find uh, uh, connections or do multicasting, for covering a network, a minimum dominating set kind of problem, for doing ranking, um, for finding sets of maximum influence like in the KKT model. Okay. So a few questions, and then I really want to give you guys a 15 or 20 minute break. <laughs> okay, so um, are there any questions? Okay, so I have a question. Uh, the problem you described is very connected with the problem Yandex faces while crawling the web, especially in new countries. Uh, but in realistic settings, we usually have a set of seed pages, really important pages, which can be found in some open catalogs. So my question is uh, how these seed pages can help you to do, have some ideas about it. So um, the question you're talking about is something like a page rank yeah, like type of problem. Yes, this type of problem, uh, significant page rank uh, problem you described. So, similar. so you're asking if I start from some particular seed. So let me think about the steps that we took. So we have, um, so we have P, V for some very large ones. Um, and then I guess there's a question of whether those seed pages are getting their contributions pretty uniformly or whether they are getting them from some highly concentrated set of sites, right? A, a priori, well, he says there's some catalog, so he can. So, so that's what I'm asking. The characteristics, are the characteristics that this is a page that everybody is linking to, or there's some kind of a hierarchical structure where there are the large, because if it is the case that there's a hierarchical structure where you know, the, the quite large ones are contributing to the really, really large ones, then you're going to try to exploit it in a different way than if it's kind of a uniform, if it's a, if it's a, more, um, a more uniform contribution, I'm not sure it would help us that much. If there's more of a hierarchical structure, then presumably we should do a backwards random walk out of those, right? So, uh, actually, what I wanted to say is that actually the top pages is really easy to find because they're usually mentioned in, in some catalogs. And the hard problem is to work in the middle uh, region of page rank. This is not so obvious. Mm -hmm. um, Christian, do you have any ideas on that? I mean, my, my idea would be if there was some hierarchical structure, I would, but I'm sure you do this anyway, you would start from those and start doing backwards random walks out of those if those indeed have large contributors to but of them. Of course, you don't, 
you can't make backwards uh, uh, because, because you, you don't have because you haven't crawled you have those only because you haven't things. crawled those. Um, Uh, yeah, this is the question. I'm not. It's actually a really nice question. I'm. I'm not sure of the answer, but I mean, okay, mathematically, <laughs> it. Even if you let me assume some model, okay. Um, uh, it's a. It's a. It's a very nice question. My guess is that there is some hierarchy to it um, I'm not sure what the answer is but it's a very it but it's actually just purely mathematically it's a nice question so and I don't know the answer are there any other questions other questions okay you put Due to the different access rules, right. I think it's exactly what Remco said, that what happens is that you, just with this little bit of extra information, you are able to avoid those kind of dead paths. Okay, you're, because typically, um, when you have that one extra piece of information, you don't get stuck in essentially, if not dead ends, sparse ends. So. But they give you different access. That's the whole point. If, I mean, I, I do believe, actually, that the structure of the two networks is extremely similar, but one of them, in its rules, gives me enough information to cover it quite quickly, and the other one does not give me enough information to cover it quickly. I mean, it, it actually really surprised us. We, we weren't expecting that. We, we were just doing these things, and then we said, oh my God, this makes this huge difference. And then we looked, and actually, LinkedIn and Facebook had these different rules. And I don't think that the people who designed LinkedIn had this in mind and said, oh, we're going to be better than Facebook. That's not clear, right? Because LinkedIn is sort of used. I know it's used by recruiters, and empirically, they might have done it. I really doubt that they saw in advance an algorithmic difference. Well, that's their, that's a big part of their business model. Right. Yeah, as a professional, as a network for headhunters, basically. So maybe, maybe even by chance they uh, they designed it that way and that was why it worked. Yeah. I I really think so. I've got I'm, I mean we who know a little bit about algorithms, okay, didn't expect it until we kind of fell over this yeah, yeah, so. this difference. So I agree with you. My guess is that it just probably took off because it's it had this feature. Yes, <laughs> because it turned out to be very effective for for this. Yeah. But how general is this claim? Is it it's only for particular networks? Well, no, no, no. So that was for general networks, but it was for a particular problem. It was for minimum dominating set, but 
you know, um, in the in the last class of problems that we did, if we hadn't been able, if we hadn't been able to put in the random step, we wouldn't have gotten the arboricity, the you know, that one over beta. I mean, and you see it all the time in algorithms, and it makes a lot of sense. If you don't have a random step, you can't explore other parts of the space. So on a heuristic level, you know, you're stuck in, in local minima. And, and in fact, also, I can give you example after example of algorithms which have a random component to them that do pretty well. And I know myself, when I try to construct an algorithm, I, I do get stuck unless I put in ran, uh, random pieces. But it, it actually makes a great deal of sense because think of energy landscapes in general. You're going to get stuck in local minima. And uh, so to explore other parts of the space, um, a random component is very, very important. I mean, really stuck, like in page rank, you can get stuck in a dead end or just, you know, stuck in a local minimum like you do in physics where you'll eventually tunnel out of it, but boy, it's going to take you a long time. So. Okay, so one, one small comment and one question. So the comment is that um, there was also a work of by Milan Mikhail who was studying how long, how long will it take before you can see the whole network. And also she, I, I'm sure you know this work, that she also figured out that if you have a possibility to see the number of neighbors, then it, it, the difference is huge in... in um, so so if you, if you, it is like random walk with look ahead, so if you add the node and you can see the number of neighbors of your neighbors, Mm -hmm. Then it makes a huge difference in how algorithm, uh, the speed of uh, your algorithm uh, before you can see the whole network. So the goal is there to see all the nodes in the network. And if you have this information of the number of neighbors of the neighbors of the node, then it can be ma done much faster. So definitely this is very important information. So it is... Uh, so, we, and, and you say that somebody had done this at... No, 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 not what no. you did, not what yeah. you did, but, uh, but it, was, uh, it was a different problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was also, they, they also noticed that if you have this additional information... Okay, I, 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 so I didn't know of another, pl I mean, I can believe it because it's really true, but if you know of a reference, that would be great. Yeah, I will give it to Yeah. No, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Milena Mikhail it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. They call it like random walk with look ahead. But it was about different problem. Okay. But also yeah. And the question is, um, when you um, compute this page rank, uh, the most important page rank node, so the, um, the random walk I understand, but if you don't have any a priori information, then how do you do the second uh, sampling, what you said, but you, you chose this, uh, only not all contributors, no ran, not random contributors, but most important contributors. So when you, at the beginning, you don't know anything, then how do you do this? How you choose these clever seeds, this? Uh so you mean the multi-scale? Yeah, or? the multi-scale, yes. Uh, so what, what, what happens with the multi-scale is that I don't, probe for that long at any particular, so I, so I look, I look for a small time at a fine scale, and then for larger times at larger and larger scales. Does that? Well, the point is that the more precise you want to calculate the, the personalized page rank in the first step, the longer your algorithm runs, roughly yeah. one over F. So if you just naively sample in the interval from zero to n in order to get enough contribution at the small scales, you have to sample have for to a very long time. For a very long time. And then the small scales will in the end not give you much anyhow because they're probably not contribution to the large page. Yeah. So if instead you divide your intervals into so your the thing into intervals. So group them. Say, I'm going to look at the individuals, so or I can look at I blocks of them. And I look sort of, okay, if, so I say, okay, I sample now at position one tenth. Okay, and then I do, do a certain number of times. And then I, and I only look, when I, when I sample at position one tenth, I only look, is the page rank going to be one, between one tenth and two tenths? And then mm -hmm. I sample between eight tenths and nine tenths, and there I run it for a different time. 
and I, can, I can't afford running it very much at the very little scales because that would take a lot of time. But on the other hand, those are not that important contributions. So if you divide it up like that, it allows you to sort of match your constant, where you need sort of a lot of samples for, con for, for concentration, you can do it in an area where you have sort of the larger errors or you can tolerate larger errors and that makes it work. Yeah, that's an interesting. So, um, I, and I mean, there are, I'm sure there are lots of other places where this is done, but in mathematical physics, that kind of thing is done a lot. No, no, this so, is, uh, yeah. yeah, this is very yeah. interesting, a very interesting take, yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.